Sweet. So I, I just want to give it a second because I'm not too sure how the, the YouTube live works out. Okay, it looks like we're good to go now. Hello, beautiful people. Hope everybody's had a good start to their Saturday morning. Uh, nice and frigid outside. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time, my name is Jerry Kadar. I'm going to be your MC, facilitator, moderator, um, you know, deep state tech guy for today's conversation. Just want to thank you all for being here. If this is your first time at a Kepper Institute event, we're a nonprofit organization based right here in Indianapolis, Indiana. And we've been doing this great community wealth building work for over 20 years. Uh, we do social enterprise, youth leadership development, and, you know, we hold workshops and community conversations to build those relationships that'll make the change we want to see in the world. And we want to thank you for joining us on that journey. Uh, if, so if this is your first time, I'm definitely going to recommend you go to Kepper.org, sign up for our newsletter so you don't miss any programs, workshops, conversations we got going on in the near future. We got a lot of great stuff going on in the space, uh, and we want you to be a part of it. So I'm also going to encourage you to go to Kepper.org forward slash get involved. And uh, hey, maybe get involved with all the great stuff we got going on. But uh, without further ado, I think we can just hop right into it. Today's Alchemy Fall Workshop Series session. Uh, we're going to be talking to our resident Afrofuturist, Maurice Broadus, as well as Corey Ewing, who is with our Cafe Creative Program, all about artistry in partnership. So how can artists build community wealth using their creative talents? You know, how can we deal with institutional partners? Uh, and, you know, just how can we make a living off of the, the art that we create? I'm, I'm very interested in this particular topic as a creative myself. Uh, you might see some guitars in the back. So um, I'm looking forward to today's conversation. I say we can hop right into some check-ins. So if you don't know, we have a check-in ritual here at the Kepper Institute. If today was a color, what color would it be? If today was a number, what number would it be? And we also have a special check-in question just to get to know each other a little bit better. So um, let's say in one sentence for today's special check-in question, in one sentence, how have you changed over the past year, if at all? And I can get us going, lead by example here. I'm feeling like a... <laughs> The third time in a row, Scarlet Tank, because I've been playing Pokemon in this lit and I'm having a lot of fun. I feel like a little kid again. Um, and I, I have definitely changed over the past year, for sure. Um, I say the biggest changes that I've gone through here recently, um, I really rekindled my love for reading. I used to hate it because school would force it on me. But hey, when I get to read stuff I actually want to read and I actually want to know, uh, it, it's a great experience. And I always feel like I get a lot from it. It's nice to be able to take things from books and act like they're my ideas now. Uh, so I, I definitely have gotten into reading again. And I'll pass it off to Jasmine. So my number for the day, I'm at a nine right now. And it could be a 10 later. Um, my color is going to be quartz, um, rose quartz, pink. And mm, how have I changed in the past year? I've made a lot of changes. Um, I guess the biggest change that I've made is um, a fitness journey. I started working out more consistently. And then um, another change is just really standing in the um, work to life balance. I used to be a workaholic. So I've been trying to take more time out for myself and my family this year. Um, I'll pass it to Maurice. Hello, everybody. Um, oh, as an addendum to uh, the, the conversations that will be going on today, uh, Jasmine will also be sharing her story um, as a member of Cafe Creative and as an entrepreneur. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing that, Jasmine. Um, uh, my color is a Viridian. Uh, my number is nine, and uh, one way I have changed over the last year, I think it's, uh, it's you know the continuing process of what it means to uh, be a leader, what it means to walk by example, what it means to uh, 
uh, walk into hard spaces, uh, both internally and in, in relationship with one another, what it means to hold each other into account. So uh, that's probably the biggest way that uh, I've been changing over the, the past year. And uh, I will pass it to Corey. Hey, yo, I'm a chartreuse green as always. Today's sitting at about an eight, hoping it'll get up to a nine later. I'm gonna give him flu shot boosters and all that good stuff. So it's gonna get much better from here. Um, see, in the past year, I focused more on being intentional uh, in my actions and owning up to them in it, uh, just so I can unlearn a bunch of like the toxic crap that we get taught growing up, especially as men. So uh, yeah, I will pass it off to Ms. Fair. I'm a yellow 10 and M's in the room with me and I'll take the computer over to him, but um, I'm a yellow 10. And uh, the change I've seen in myself this year at 79 and a half, I am, I'm smarter. I'm so pleased that I can read things. And as I read them, I go, oh, I know that. Let me find out more about it. And so it's, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, J. Rue, when you said that you read now and you get these new ideas and now you can claim them as your own, they are yours. That's how I've gotten smarter by reading other people's thoughts and ideas, adventures and ways of getting to where they wanna go. And so um, that's my big change and I'll unhook and take this over to him. Here you go, buddy. Hey, hey. Uh, color is gonna be sunshine yellow, like last week, sun shining in the window. Cause the tree was unfortunately a transition cut down, but the sun shines great. Uh, number today is going to be uh, by about an eight point five, and man, there's been a lot of growth personally over the course of the year. But the one that came to me this morning, um, when I first woke up, was um. I've been reflecting a lot on rhythms and vibrations. Um, and this morning, what came to me was um, this book I had read, gosh, way, way back when, college, by an anthropologist, Edward T. Hall. And uh, one of the things in the book was about the book I think is called The Dance of Life. And he studied rhythms, uh, community rhythm, rhythms, uh, social rhythms tied to different cultural folks. I think he studied some indigenous indigenous Americans and others. But um I'm actually just paying more attention to different spaces that I find myself in and the different, what I'll call band members in those spaces and how there are individual rhythms based on the individual players that show up uh, on stage. And then there's a collective rhythm that's uh, brought on by, uh, to, that exists above and beyond the individual. So, just paying a lot more attention to, to that. And then I'm also looking at that tied to uh, the current rhythms uh, uh, in, a, in a very small world now. Because, you know, something happened anywhere in the world now, you know it instantly. And that, that in and of itself impacts your personal rhythm and also the rhythms of your, your very social spaces. So that's... Uh, that's kind of where my head's at right now. Uh, I'll pass it to Azai. <laughs> Another big head in the room. <laughs> All right, Azai, pass it to you, bro. He's a uh, saucy red nine. And what has he, what have you learned? He learns how to grab the computer and slap and 
and just cheese and do whatever he wants. I heard he's after your wallet now on a regular basis. Uh, that's one of his favorite play tools. That's how I start giving it to him now. <laughs> that's good because you don't want him to just have to rob you. <laughs> no, no, not at all. But that very little, he it's not even worth the trouble. All right, so uh, let's do uh, Pearl 9. Uh, I think this year the biggest change would probably be listening, which has helped with patience. Um, and not just the listening with the ears, but listening with, you know, the flow of life and respecting what it's telling you, even if you don't like it, um, and give you more patience and slow you down and help you out a ton. So um, I just use as uh, being able to see hurdles 50 feet out instead of rushing the roadblocks. Um, and I'll pass it to, let's just get the last Adisa up out of here. I'll pass it to Yanni. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Nyandi Adisa. I'm like a, a four. I've been up for just one hour and well, a little bit more than an hour. So I still have a lot of time and I expect to get to at least a nine or a 10. And my color is going to be like a mauve because I'm just not there yet. Got to drink more coffee. And I would say in the last year, I have gotten more in touch with my artistic side, as well as knowing more of the inner workings of my mental and emotional beings. And I have also begun to try to let people know that I appreciate them and I love them as often as possible um, just because of everything I've been through in my own personal life and what we've all been through together. So I would say those are some of the ways, but I mean, as he was speaking about the rhythm, I have been, I call them wavelengths, trying to tap into the wavelengths of beings regardless of they whether they speak the language you speak. And I will pass it to Damien, my other brother. <laughs> Thank you, sis. Happy <laughs> birthday, man. Thank you. Appreciate you. Um, Happy birthday. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yep. 44. 44. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. Um, Hey, happy birthday. Appreciate it. Appreciate hey, it. Hey, man, you almost grown up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having my 55. I'm sure you're going to make it. Congratulations, baby. You've come this far. Happy yeah, birthday to you. Yeah, 44 is good. Uh, I think about a lot of... Uh, you know, a lot of the ancestors of that. I grew up with that aren't here anymore that were targeted, you know, murdered, killed. And, you know, I'm blessed to be 44. So, um, it's just gratitude really and appreciation. So, uh, Hazel, Hazel Brown, 10, I think I think that's I think that's my joint Hazel Brown 10. So <laughs> uh I feel good, I feel great. Um uh, appreciate the Kepper family, of course, uh uh hyping me up last night. Appreciate that. <laughs> Got me drunk. Hey, that uh, was fun. That was fun. Appreciate <laughs> that. So uh it's all good, it's all good energy. I'm gonna go see Wakanda with the family and appreciate the day. Uh, and I think, you know, that's one thing that I talk about the lesson uh, is learning how to be uh, appreciative uh, and grateful uh, every day. So I'll pass it to, uh, I don't know who hasn't gone. Pass it to Jasmine. Mimi. Uh, Mimi hasn't gone. I'll pass it to Mimi. Okay. Oh, I love you. Hey y'all, um, feeling like an opal eight and a half and man, uh, 
<laughs> I don't say a lot of things, but um, probably just continuing to um, get better at flowing with my own ups and downs and like understanding them and like just improving my rebound time so that if I'm going through like a little dark valley, I keep moving through it instead of like building a house there <laughs> and trying to set up camp. <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is a familiar landscape. It doesn't like shock me as much. And I know that that's not my destination. So just getting better at that and, and definitely agree with also like the flow, like discernment is a big thing that I'm practicing, which involves being way increasing my awareness of myself, where I'm at, others, where they're at, who I'm dancing with, what moment we're in. So just trying to really be present and asking myself on the front end, like about this, this dance that I'm in in this moment. And I feel like I've gotten a lot better at accepting when that's not exactly what I wanted it to be and not as much just always trying to Rambo it into that situation, getting frustrated because forcing it didn't work. <laughs> so now sometimes I'm a little bit, a little bit more relaxed. I'm like, oh yeah, okay. That's not gonna happen right now. All right, and I think, Corey, did you go? Okay. Uh, was I the last one? Okay, pass it back to whoever. Sweet. So uh, I think we can take this a couple of different ways. I think we're going to start it out by uh, speaking to a couple of our guest workshop leaders today about their stories and just how they came into a creative space. Uh, maybe some of the things they've been learning on their journey so far. And I think in true Kepper tradition, we should start youngest and go to the oldest. So how about we start with Jasmine? Jasmine, can you um, introduce yourself a little bit, you know, a bit about who you are and again, how you came into the creative space, maybe how you found Cafe Creative, some of the things you've been working on, some of the things you've been learning. Yeah, so um, in this conversation, I'm going to focus on culinary arts. And I started cooking at a very young age. My mother um, worked very long hours. So my sister and my grandmother were my primary caretakers and I was a very picky eater. So my sister took me into the kitchen one evening and she whipped up some eggs, put them in a pan um, and folded them over and gave me some hot sauce to eat with it. And she was like, here, Jasmine, here are some egg tacos <laughs> because she knew how much I enjoy tacos. Um, from then, she taught me how to recreate it myself. So now I had, it, I had um, expanded my recipes from chocolate milk to what is actually an omelet. And from there, my curiosity in the kitchen just expanded. And my grandmother and my father would help me whenever I found a recipe on the back of a carton um, of sugar or the back of oatmeal. And I'll be like, hey, can y'all teach me how to make this? They would. And up until I would say about six years old is when I actually got the OK to prepare meals on my own in the kitchen. And I flourished um, by the age of 11. I beat my grandmother in a collard green cooking cook off, which is unheard of because your grandmother is the matriarch of the family. She makes the best food and everybody enjoys her food. Um, but in a blind taste test. I had beat her. Um, from then, I would just prepare meals for my family because, like I said, my mother um, worked long hours. So it was put on me because besides the eggs, my sister sucked. Have you ever had a wet and soggy um, grilled cheese? Kasma can get that for you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, I took on that role in my family. And then um, by the age of 17, I started living alone. So from 17 to 22 years old, I lived by myself and I had to prepare my own meals. 
I didn't really have a gauge on portions. So when I would go to the grocery store, if I bought a pack of meat, I cooked the whole pack of meat. So it could be ranging from servings for four to 12 people, depending on what I found at a, at a good price. And um, I would record the process of it on the newest social media platform, which at the time was Snapchat. So many people were engaged with the food that I was creating that they um, asked to see the processes. And I started to record the processes. I started to record the finishing point. I would take requests and I started to help my friends, um, people's girlfriends and so on, learn how to cook better in the kitchen. <laughs> and um, after that, it was 2019, late 2019, um, two people that were very important in my life, my, my sister and then a cousin who was also like a sister to me, talked to me on separate occasions. Um, my sister told me that I should start looking for grants for what I do so that I could start to make a profit off of it. And then she sent me a grant from the Center of Wellness for Urban Women, which is Siwu um, in Indianapolis. And then my cousin, she texted me and she was like, Jasmine, <laughs> like you don't have portion control. So you need to start selling the, the remainder of the food that you have. So I took both of their advice. I applied for reluctantly I'm telling you, cause I didn't know, I didn't think my writing was good enough for grants. So I did apply for the grant. And then I did start to sell food um, through my social media platform. And most of my customers were young men, like, um, 18 to 35 year old men who I would just take a scar from container, um, create the food, sell it, meet up with them and sell it to them. And then um, by 2020, I'd have found out that I had been awarded the Siwoo grant where I was able to refine everything that I was doing, the food education portion of it and a little bit of the selling portion of it. Um, from there, I was able to get some marketing assistance where somebody was able to help me definitively um, know what my demographic was. And that's why I can tell you that it was men, black men, ranging from the ages of 18 to 35. And then I also got, um, came up with my business, uh, my business name, which is 1610 Eats, which is based off of um, my grandmother's address where I started cooking. Um, and I also um, made my business into an LLC. From then, my business has taken off in ways that were unimaginable to me at the time. Initially, after getting all that stuff from Siwoo, I thought that I would be focused on more of like private chef because it had less restrictions um, and also food education. Right now, I primarily serve as a caterer for my community. And how I got into Cafe Creative is because my sister found a uh, Kepra because of their community controlled um, food initiative, CCFI. And she um, was giving those buckets to people in this, um, I'm gonna say financially insecure neighborhood constitution gardens. So from then she started to bring me around more cause she was very interested in Kepra and the work that they did. And she actually was a original, not an original member of uh, Cafe Creative, she was actually in the alchemy program and she was with Damon, but then she transitioned to Cafe Creative. And then I um, heard about them that way, but I didn't start going to the meetings until I started working for Kepper myself. So what Cafe Creative has offered me is a lot. Um, if you've ever been into that space as a creative, then you know that we really fellowship in there. Um, it, you could either be invited by someone that's already there, um, or you have to be a former alchemy participant that was a creative in order to enter. So it's a very sacred place where you can talk about the struggles that you go through with your art. What they also do is give you the freedom to um, express yourself and be creative. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions for me? Uh, I have one. Yeah. <laughs> So how important is it to have a, a space where you can be able to um, experiment, to fail? Uh, what, what kind of uh, places I have in, in the development of, of you as a creative? 
Well, I feel like this space is amazing. I feel like um, people of color don't often get this opportunity. Once we turn 18 and some people even 16, we are thrust into the workforce because we have to provide for ourselves usually and for our families a lot of the time. So I'm thankful for Cafe Creative to give me um, the opportunity to be creative and to fail because I might not have had this opportunity otherwise. I have a question also. Uh, how would you describe the journey of incorporating your creative experience with your entrepreneurial journey? What, what's, what are the similarities uh, and what are some of the, the, um, the unique challenges you find that creatives have in the, as entrepreneurs? Well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of the challenges that I've seen. Um, some of the challenges that I see for food specifically, even though it's um, defined as culinary arts, a lot of people don't see the work that I do as arts. So for a lot of the grant funding, there's very little. Um, if, you, if you Google it right now, you'll probably find scholarships to go to culinary arts school, but not any grants in order to help fund it. So a lot of the money that you'll have to get um, doing what I do has to be based off what you create. I still get the same stresses in, of vulnerability by creating my art. I'm always, it's still my baby when I make it. So I'm like, how will people take my art? Um, and as far as making it a legitimate LLC, for me, it has to be that. I, I need the red line in order to sell these things. Like I, I need all of those things. I need my safe, my serve safe certification. I need it to be an LLC so that I can not be getting money illegally. And then the IRS come and Wesley snipe me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, it ha they have to come together. Um, and then I'm trying to think there is another challenge that I see. Yeah, I just think the ch my challenges are um, trying to find free money around it um, and the vulnerability of giving your art to people to the masses those are my challenges and you know wesley told the government he wasn't paying there is a somewhat of a difference there well <laughs> I, i'll tell them here i'm not paying <laughs> yeah you tell them here you're gonna pay them don't come out to me <laughs> I just, man, I'm gonna pay <laughs> Hey, listen, a dollar, dollar, dollar to the day you die, just a dollar. <laughs> yeah, and another thing, too, is that I, I have a lot more money to give up front with my art because I have to buy groceries in order to create it. Um, with other types of art, it's a little bit, it's um, a low financial investment in order to create it, and then they get more back in return. Are you lucky to be alive from beating your grandmother in a uh, collard green contest? <laughs> I, honestly, I beat everybody in my family, and they yeah, know but, it now. But the, but the grandmama's the one that uh, <laughs> I'm sure she's very proud of you. Was there anything like as you were getting your business going? I mean, you started your enterprise, what well, I would consider pretty young, you know, in, in your mid 20s. So you know, were there any like big surprises for you as you were kind of crafting that and going through those those baby steps? Yeah, 100 percent. So um, I consider myself like uh, I'm the I'm kind of like the crash dummy when it comes to I'm doing well, though, but I am a first generation entrepreneur. So there were I didn't have a lot of people in my personal life that I could pull from to get advice on what I was doing. And in fact, um, I faced a lot of adversity in that where when I would be doing something, if I had a catering or, for, or if um, originally when I was just selling the food, if somebody wanted to pull up to my house that was family and they saw the food, they felt as though they should get it for free. So um, <laughs> having to tell people no, this is something that is my business and I'm trying to like survive. I'm trying to build something off of it. Hey, some family, they are not around no more. Some friends, they are not around anymore because of the lack of respect um, of what I was doing. So I guess one of the advice that I did get from family 
um, because I do have some family that ha has gotten money in different ways. Um, I got some that have who have been really shysty about it. And I got some that are like more. No, I'm, I'm going to tell y'all, I'm gonna, like, they're going to be more honest about it. And the best advice is just like, F what people say, you're not going to please everybody. I'm still working on taking that one to heart, though. So let's say I'm an upstart entrepreneur. I uh, got this special uh, cookie I want to put out in the streets. What would be uh, some do's and don'ts you would share from your learned experience? You live, learn, experience. So cookies are cool and interesting because they have a, um, a lot less of the red tape. Um, you don't necessarily, I believe you don't need your, your serve safe in order to sell cookies. And you can make them out of your home. Um, but what you will need is packaging or um, something that goes with how you present it to let people know where it was created. You still have to let label it and let people know what's in it. So if people have allergies and things like that. And um, what I would say with anybody who is looking to be an entrepreneur is to be persistent. Yeah, I think the state has changed a lot. And I think you can naturally uh, make food uh, at, in, out of your own house without uh, uh, going to a commercial kitchen. Mm -hmm. Recently changed rule. Yeah. But you can um you can't sell it if you don't have a serve safe. Right. That's the only difference. Right. Awesome. Were there any more questions for Jasmine at the moment? So I think we are gonna hear from from each of our uh, cafe creative guests again just about their story and their journeys a little bit, ask a couple questions. And then I'm pretty sure after we wrap that up, we'll just have a, a big Q&A and we'll be able to talk freely and openly. Uh, at sorry, that point. Jerry, I do got one question before we shift gears. Go for it. Uh, Jasmine, what's your favorite thing to make, meal or, or item? It changes all the time and it, it's based on what I'm inspired by. More recently, um, I've, been, I've been inspired to create like these soul food classics that my grandmother taught me, but make them vegan. And I have gotten vegan approval about um, what I've been able to create. Have you gotten meat eater approval on the vegan items? Uh, here we go. <laughs> I've got my own approval. Um, Maurice and Corey, that chili that you ate last week was vegan. And they were very quiet as they ate it. They loved it. <laughs> There was none left. It's gone. That's exactly <laughs> what you have to do, too. You I have think to we had to a lot of Marie, so we would eat it, right? <laughs> right, because I object to that just philosophically. So. <laughs> That's how you do a true test. You tell them later. <laughs> so, Marie, you're a vegan now, man. <laughs> no, apparently, I'm apparently I just converted. Yes, right, no, I, he, I, he, <laughs> he enjoys vegan food. Put a piece of steak in front of him. Come on over here. I, I got a piece of filet mignon for you. Let's do, let's do. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, Maurice has been my biggest challenge when it comes to vegan food. So because he he is very open about his dislike for most vegetables. Um, so I've been like bringing in like different dishes and I've seen him enjoy it. So I've made vegan gumbo, um, vegan chili, vegan cornbread. And he enjoys it all the same. Along that uh, same line, now I'm curious, like, had there been any dishes at 1610 Eats that have been particularly popular? Oh, my God, yes. Um, so when I first started cooking, um, there were two dishes that, I created um, my own recipe too, but they were inspired by my travels. Oddly, when I went to Poland, I had the best Alfredo I ever had in my life. And that was in 2016. And when I came back home, I spent a lot of time trying to perfect it. I wanted it to taste just like what I had. There's still another tweak that I have to make and it's, a, it's around the broccoli because the broccoli was like either pan seared. I think it was pan seared because it was still very green. 
um, but it looked, but it tasted roasted. So it added this other layer of uh, flavor to it. And so that is a very popular thing when I make that. And um, another thing that's very been very popular um, inspired from my travels to Toronto, Canada, I went to this Jamaican um, restaurant called Patois and they had the best oxtails I've ever had in my life. I literally ate the whole dish with my eyes closed because I needed to see all the lights. I needed ratatouille. Like you, you remember the movie when it's just like fireworks, fireworks. It was like that for me. So um, when I came back home, I really tried to recreate whatever that sauce was. And um, that sauce in my business is called Jazzy Sauce. So um, it's also a combination of alkaline ingredients, how I, pre how I prepare it too, um, minus the garlic. But yeah. So those are two things that have been things that people always want. People want to buy the jazzy sauce itself or they want to um, get it on everything. And people try, have tried and failed to get the Alfredo sauce recipe um, or they just order it a lot. The Alfredo okay. is the bomb for everybody who hasn't had it. She's catered for... Uh... 25th street um a couple of times and over here on this campus we in it when she's making it okay i have a couple more questions just off of what you were saying one what what uh encouraged that trip to poland and yeah i'll just start with that one i'm just curious why you're out there yeah so in 2015, I um, I started going to IEPUI and I was a commuter. And prior to that, I had gone to Ivy Tech. And I was just like, I'm just ready for a real college experience. I had looked around at different organizations that I wanted to be a part of. A lot of them gave me anxiety. <laughs> so I was like, How, what can I really do to make myself feel involved here? There were two professors um, within the communications department that I really enjoyed. And one was Dr. Parrish Sproul, and he was the head of our um, abroad, um, our abroad course. So he came to me. He obviously presented it to the whole court, the whole class. But one day he came to me personally. And he was like, Jasmine, I really think that you should you should come and you should be a part of this. And it was like exactly what I was looking for. So I applied and I was accepted and I went. And it was a really cool and interesting experience where I got to eat lots of food. How long were you there? It was just a um, summer two week experience. Yep. Okay, now I have one last, last question for you. Um, and again, others can come in at any time, but um, I'm curious, cause you know, at the Kepper Institute, we talk a lot about like grit, pushing through, you know, even Mimi was talking about, you know, you find yourself in a valley and you want to build a, a camp there, but you got to keep pushing through it. So, you know, what was a time where you were looking at this culinary arts game and you were kind of tossing your hands up, like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, was there even a moment like that? And if there was, how did you, how did you push through it? Or, you know, what supported you to push through? She's a good storyteller. So I'm in my... I'm technically in my third year of this, but this is officially my second year um, of being a business owner. And I went through that journey this year. Um, and it is like, now that I'm thinking about it, it just happened, but I, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I received some criticism about my food and um, it it just really hurt me. I, I do accept criticism. Um, I accept critique. I'm sorry. I accept critique. I feel like criticism Thank you. To, is just to bring me down sometimes. So it was just like, your stuff is trash. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, and I'm not, and I'm, I'm understanding that when I hit the court every day, like it's not, I'm not going hard. Like I'm not MJ every day. Sometimes I'm a supporting player. I'm probably on the bench, but I still got the ring. So, um, it was just that. And then also me knowing that I'm so disorganized with my business. I was like, oh my God, like 
what am I doing here? Um, in the first year, especially, I put a lot of my own money into it. There have been um, caterings where people have given me a certain amount of money and I did like match up the price for based, based on what they ordered. But then when I get in the store, I was like, nah, I want to make this experience better for them. I'm going to buy all this extra stuff. So I put, I'm putting myself in debt for like a year and a half and all of it just started to hit me. And I'm sorry, cause I'm getting teary eyed, but, um, it was really a conversation with Maurice and Damon and, um, also feeling overwhelmed because I kept getting large caterings. Um, primarily I operate as a single person in my business. Um, and I had to start hiring people this year, but I'm getting caterings for a hundred people making 250 portions of things. And I'm doing it mostly by myself. And I'm like, I don't know if I can keep putting myself in debt. I don't know if I can keep operating like this. And I don't know if I even will have the money next year to continue. And I don't know if I'm doing it well. But Damon was just telling me that my journey as an entrepreneur is just so authentic. He was like, you really have like, kind of like the dream story, like to go into this and to find people that want you so bad and to get business consistently. Like your path is supposed, like what you're doing now, you're supposed to be doing. And just that reaffirmation really touched my heart. Um, It took me about a week of reflection, some prayer. And then I was like, you know what? Like, and then also some stories. I cook for like maybe three people. This year I got to do a wedding, a bridal shower, and now I'm doing the same family's Thanksgiving. And it took like hearing stories about how people really felt about my food. Um, over the summer, I led this communications cohort. And one of the young men in the group, his name was Isaiah. And he and I sat and talked one day outside of that space. And he was like, Jasmine, I'm, I'm a really picky eater. I don't like nuts. I don't like sweet food. I don't like this. I don't like that. And all of those things that he disliked, I had cooked for him before. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, but it's something about the way that you make your food. It feels like a hug. He was like, literally, after I finished eating your food, I feel so happy. I don't know what ingredients you're putting into it, but I feel so happy every time that I, I finish eating your food. And I had another person tell me the same thing. And it was like, okay, that's purposeful. Um, I'm meeting my purpose because when I would cook, I pray over the food and I pray that the food that I prepare for people fills them and heals them. And to be affirmed that my food was doing that, it just meant so much to me. I can't give up. I can't give up. I can't stop. And I don't know how I got into this. Um, I mean, I know that I've had the natural talent but I don't know how I got into entrepreneurship because like I said, nobody else has done it before me, but I just felt like somebody in my family pray for this and I'm yes. going to be able to um, fulfill their prayers in my work. Jasmine, I was great. You're a great storyteller. And, uh, yes. Appreciate your vulnerability. Uh, I would challenge you to reflect on some of the lessons learned here. Uh, and also... You know, I think when you when you opened up this conversation, you were starting through the ideas of being a chef, uh, and, and your journey has led you down different roads. But you can still always come back in the midst of the experience and decide uh, what your food journey in entrepreneurship should be for you. You may come back later and say, "Hey, look, uh, serving two hundred fifty people is not my thing. That's not what I do." I'm an artist and you can still do entrepreneurship, but take the lessons learned and, and you stay in control of who you serve and how you serve and just master those business aspects. Also, lastly, all opportunities ain't opportunities. They may look like opportunities, but at the end of the day, they, you may come back and discover that was a mistake. And you, you, you know, you take the lesson, learn and keep moving. Now that piece with debt, you really got to be looking at uh, as an entrepreneur the, the the challenge of cash flow and debt and and what is your level of uh, risk aversion, 
and 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 create a model that allows you to be okay in the midst of the challenge of entrepreneurship. So uh, through that, you 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 find a way to create an entrepreneurial model that serves your your vision and your interest. Yeah. Well, let, one, hey, let me know when those oxtails are available. I'd like to get some <laughs> of those. One thing I wanted to add, and, and this is um, part to my own experience, is that, um, and this is just me, so, you know, everybody's different, but if you are an artist and an entrepreneur, I generally tend to uh, want to preserve the art over the entrepreneurship. Now, that doesn't mean I'm I, at both. I am I am true to both spirits, but there's been a time where I uh, prioritized the entrepreneurship over the art and I lost the love for the art. Um, and for me, that was uh, filmmaking. I got burnt out on it because it went from something that soothed me, something that was creative to a product, to a conversation with the world that I didn't like the dynamic I set up. Now, fortunately, I was uh, already... Uh, cultured enough to train others and transfer that passion and that that skill to others so it hurts less when you can see that you help someone else along their journey and now that is their main um, main mode of expression but uh, I think you know art is fueled by the spirit and the heart and a lot of times we have to pour that into entrepreneurship because it does not sit in that connotation or that context so if you can preserve that that, that what is it about this that makes my spirit feel well, then the mastery will continue and the entrepreneurship opportunities and even the different ways to leverage resources and impact people will always be there. And, and so that's another thing. And that's not a, a negative uh, slant on your entrepreneurship if you have to stop to go forward or if you change the direction in which you choose to have that economic conversation with the world. So I just wanted to share that. I think the only, the only yeah, thing I would add to that, thanks, Diop, is um, because you do take it personally, at least for me as an artist or entrepreneur, entrepreneur is what I like to call it, is that um, I would put a lot of my personal value into my work and the output, and then you open yourself up. That's what you have to do as an artist, regardless, is be vulnerable and open yourself up. And so to put that in the context of entrepreneurship, uh, the sooner you can get it out of that context, um, the better you'll be able to withstand what you have to go through in entrepreneurship or be able to look at it differently. It's not a reflection of myself, but a reflection of necessarily that condition or that that system that I'm operating or sharing my art with. And so like, like all these heart moments that you talked about in your journey, like that is a success that you've already achieved in art and entrepreneurship. And so every day you stepping out on that faith is 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 the art of entrepreneurship, if that makes sense. Um, and so, so then I, what practices do you incorporate to 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 speak to speak more, if you can, more concretely uh, to what you do? To so do first, first, first and foremost, and this is what I struggle with and particularly what careful helped me with is that I had to acknowledge failure in entrepreneurship as opposed to you know, patching a tire, you got that hood tire, you keep pulling it out, you're putting up the patch on it, you put it back in that joint and you ride it for that weekend, whatever. I, you know, I had I, that patch, you know, that 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 was a part of it. Um, and so um, what I do now is uh, I, I meditate. Um, I have an accountability circle. Um, uh, I, I speak outwardly and I get feedback on how to move forward from the people that I trust in that circle. Um, um, and I try to assert myself uh, daily in, in my in my entrepreneurship practice. But what I've also found is that um, the most important part of entrepreneurship that I remember from my failures were the relationships that I built. And so I try to keep that center in entrepreneurship. Um, and that's what entrepreneurship is for. Like all these networks, all these systems in the world are really built and stood up by people. And so relationship is central to that. So I try to keep that, uh, I try to keep that central to what I do, but it also means that I have to know that I'm worthy of the relationship. And so that's, again, that's another daily practice, but you know, you, 
you you a beast you know what i mean you're a monster so it don't even <laughs> it don't even matter like you and and i mean that in the most uh beautiful way like just keep doing what you're doing Jasmine, did you have any uh, final thoughts you wanted to share before we give Corey some space? No, I'm ready for him to take over and share his story. Sweet. Well, uh, thank you, Jasmine, for sharing your story. And like Em said, you know, getting real vulnerable with us, getting real real with us. Uh, it's always really appreciated. So uh, with that being said, Corey, if you'd like to uh, hop on the mic, Again, talk to us a little about, you know, your journey, how you came into Cafe Creative. You know the drill. <laughs> right. Um, so I guess I took a couple angles into Cafe Creative with my artistry. Um, I started writing when I was in middle school. Um, at the time, I thought I was very, I, no, I was, I was religious at the time. Um ended up not being the path that I would stay on with it. So I would be writing in Sunday school and it, it was bad poetry. It was really, really bad. Um, thankfully, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> uh, but it's something that was very persistent uh, when I was younger. It was definitely an outlet that was needed. Um, I grew up in Brightwood here at a, a not very good time to be in Brightwood. Um, and throughout the 90s and stuff so there wasn't there weren't a lot of options outside of taking some risk I didn't need to take um at home so writing really let me escape from that and I think that's one of the things that drew me to you know where I started writing in church and everything just like the fellowship and having community and beginning to understand what that meant so that was something that was instilled in me at the beginning of my journey I just didn't know it was um, and it would come back around later with Cafe Creative. Um, so, yeah, so throughout high school, college, kept writing. Um, I remember in high school, I had a really awesome speech uh, coach. Uh, it was mandatory to take a speech class um, to get your uh, diploma and everything. But I started doing speech team first. So my whole speech uh, class was spent as an independent study where I just got to work on stuff for speech team uh, for a whole semester. And it culminated into us going to see our, our teacher taking me to see Deaf Poetry Jam on Broadway. Uh, they came to Clues Hall. And I remember being so close, I could see the spit flying out of their mouths. And these people were just the best poets. I didn't know you could do this stuff with poetry. All I had were like the classical poets that they taught us, you know, just the slew of old white men who yeah, it was it slapped back then, but it just really didn't hold up for everybody unless we were taught that it had to that this was good. This is the standard. And it wasn't. There's a lot of other stuff out there at the time that was ex far exceeded what they did. So that really showed me what poetry could be. And as soon as we left, I was like, yo, this is what I want to do. Um, so in high school, when you do a speech team um, and or do poetry with it, you can't use your own work, at least at the time. So you just put together this program of other people's poetry. And I was like, I'm going to recreate their stuff as best I can. I'm going to go so hard with this. Um, and I did. And it was a really cool experience. Worked out really well. You know, finished high in the state competition, went on to nationals, all this stuff. It was really cool. Um, but then I graduated high school and I was uh, in the military at the time. And I went to Tuskegee. And sometime before I got there, if they ever did, Tuskegee got rid of all of their arts programs. So I remember um, oh. like my little speech competition. I was also a theater kid. Um, I ended up going very opposite of the route of Brightwood <laughs> by the time I was a teenager. Um, and I remember like doing my last, the last production I was in was Little Shop of Horrors. I got to play the plant and work that thing. And I remember like the last time, like, yeah, this is it. Like, this is, this might be where I stopped doing art. Um, I was going into college to be commissioned in the military as an officer. And that was going to be my, my life route. I pretty much had things planned out to be retired by the age of 37 and then figure something else out. But yeah, I thought it was just going to be a soldier. Um, and much like the religion, I found out that was not for me. Either. <laughs> um, and when I left the military, it was a very, it was the first time in my life where I didn't have much direction. Um, it was very much the low point, I would say. I spent a couple years in my grandmother's basement, just very depressed. I didn't have, I didn't know where I wanted to go with things, but I knew I wasn't done. Um, 
And I, a friend of mine told me to come to this poetry open mic in the basement of a bar called Casbah and Broad Ripple. And it was an event called Vocab. Um, and that changed everything for me. Uh, once I started going to Vocab, it was the first place I got to feature at doing my poetry. Um, it would kick off me spending a couple years as a touring artist on the road and everything. Uh, it's founded by my best friend, Tatiana Rebel um in 2007 this yeah that was <laughs> that was 2007 um so i came in between that um i went out to college in new york to do poetry slam it's a competitive poetry and i found it very oddly like I said i was in this little i was in a slump and i didn't know what to do and i was just looking up more poetry stuff i just kept gravitating towards that and on a Tuesday I was looking up um, info about this summer conference this poetry camp and stuff and it had a little link up in the top of the corner and it said click here to learn more about the school so that was a Tuesday and that Saturday I was flying out for the spring semester to New York didn't know anybody didn't know really what I was jumping into I just know I wanted to do poetry and I wasn't in the military I didn't have anything holding me to Indianapolis at all so I'm, like, all right, I'm just gonna pack up and go um so yeah so I did that and the first year I got there too late to compete with the team but I got to meet some of the poets understand more of how it worked and then next year made the team we got fourth in the nation and then I came back home because New York is expensive wildly expensive <laughs> even in upstate um, <laughs> and I got tired of that being as if I was a foreign exchange student because I was from Indiana like they really don't know anything outside of their borders it's such a different world for them uh so yeah so I came back and got involved with vocab and it just redirected everything I started to poetry slam again um I ran a few different spots throughout the city I think I got started at the earth house back when that was going um yeah, with the homie Sleepy P. He, he moved out to Texas since then, but we were doing things there. Um, the Sanctuary on Penn with my homie Adam Henzi, Dr. Henzi now. Um, and then we, the big hurrah was at the Indianapolis Poetry Slam at Locals Only, which is a music venue I worked at. Um, and at, all throughout college, I was a bouncer. Um, Tuskegee was a, <laughs> they didn't give too much of, care about legality in certain places around there so we were 18 bouncing in the clubs and everything and that kind of started off um my other artistry um in the service industry um behind the bar i do cocktails and mixologists some might say if they're real snooty um so those kind of like coincided throughout that time so we were doing these shows and i think in the first year of the slam we brought in close to 100 different touring artists came through uh, some cats that had been on Deaf Poetry Jam, the founder of Poetry Slam came through the spot. Like, it was really, really cool to have. We were competing at um, competitions around the country. I was doing videography um, for national and world competitions. Like, I was just full in on art, but it didn't necessarily have a community behind it. I was just an individual artist operating throughout all of this. Um, and then years later, I would come to join vocab with Tatiana. Um, and that's what really gave me, that's what brought me back to the original sense of how much I loved community and art and how much of a driving force that was. Um, so I just leaned into all the stuff that I really, really liked. And thankfully, I was also very good at. <laughs> uh, so I kept doing poetry slams, um, kept up with doing the cocktails and everything. And over the years, like got the accolades, got the recognition, doing all that stuff. Um, and then in 2020, you know, everything happened. <laughs> uh, Tatiana stepped down from vocab. All my bars got shut down. <laughs> and <laughs> I was just in that limbo for a minute, but it didn't last long, thankfully. And in those, and during that year, um, started a beverage company. Uh, so I make sodas now, also learning to make wines, um, and then also became the curator of vocab. Um, so kind of like leading the charge for it now. And that brought me to uh, meeting Maurice when Tatiana and Diop won the Creative Renewal uh, Fellowship. Uh, Tatiana invited me to the award ceremony, and she was like, yo, there's this guy, Maurice. 
I'm just going to introduce you and then I'm going to walk away. And she did that and it worked out very well. <laughs> I would say we hit it off pretty well. We uh, quickly became friends there. <laughs> um, and so at the time, Cafe Creator was in a transitional period. And I was like, you know what? I don't have a lot going on, but I don't want to, I don't, I'm not wanting to waste my time. If I don't, if I don't mess with people, I just don't. Um, but I knew that Cafe Creative was a place and working with Maurice was somewhere that I really wanted to be. Um, and that was another thing with intentionality. I intentionally made sure to you know, touch base with him or be on that porch week after week after week. Um, then that led to going through the alchemy. I uh, did alchemy, um, twice over, I guess, twice and once. I did it as an artist. Um, and then also um, as the business side with the beverage company and everything. And it was a great experience. I learned so much um, and realized how much it aligned with things that I wanted, you know, the self that I wanted to be. Um, so yeah, so that kept up and we were cooking every week, had libations at the meetings and then alchemy happened and people just stayed on. They kept coming back. Uh, didn't, necessarily plan it like that at all either it just organically happened like that so you know it was something that was definitely just the right place and the right thing right place to be in the right thing to do um and yeah it's been awesome to meet all these people and have that community again um the service industry is incredibly um one-sided in demographics, a lot of white folks there, a lot of straight white folks, and that's the full extent of it. So my day-to-day, -day, I don't have a sense of community and just like the workplace and everything. So coming to Cafe Creative every week, being able to not only be around creatives, but creatives, um, you know, that understand the perspective that I would have on things. It's very comforting and it's something that I, I've never had before. Uh, so Cafe Creative means a lot to me with it. and. Uh, yeah, I probably missed some stuff there. I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> no worries at all, Corey. Um, does anybody want to hop in with some questions? Yeah, I got a few. I'm curious, uh, <laughs> what what was your journey to the military? Why did you decide to go? What branch? And what was it? What was your journey back out of the military? And uh, what were the uh, the high level skills I'll say that you acquired from that journey. Uh, and then um, okay. uh, you, you alluded to the issue of uh, community and race. Uh, so I'm curious, what would you say about race and the challenge of being a black artist, black entrepreneur, and how, you, how do you navigate that? There was a whole lot in there. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll start with the second one. Um, the way I navigate, or it's difficult to navigate um, because you'll be in spaces and you'll realize that you're seeing things completely opposite from everyone else around you and they don't understand that they're seeing it from a white gaze and you are not. And they automatically assume that their gaze is the default. So having to operate under a different default from everyone else in the room, um, you know, you got one or two options. You either, you know, you use all the tact that you have in your bag or you just call it for what it is and let it ride out like that. Um, we were on the Gen Con panel earlier this summer and yeah, that topic came up and I was like, one of the things I love to do, thankfully I'm very good at the things I do. So I become integral to these, you know, whatever place I'm working at and everything. And once I'm there, if they haven't done right in their hiring practices, I would just politely ask the owner, how come you don't hire black people? Why is this company so white? What's wrong with that? Um, as I've done recently, I still got my job. They still hearing the heat about it. So yeah, <laughs> I'm very uh, blunt about that and just direct about it now because not, not everyone can do what I do. So go ahead, do something to me. <laughs> um, as far as the military aspect of it, I think I really needed order uh, when I was younger. And I joined the week after I turned 17, uh, young as I possibly could. My mom had to sign off for me to go and everything. Um, I did JROTC in high school. Um, all through that and everything. So I just thought that was going to be my trajectory. I knew it was it was predictable. I knew what it was going to be for the most part, at least. Um, and I was I was from Brightwood. I was about that life. I really thought I was going to be out here a steely eyed killer going over and doing things. <laughs> and I also <laughs> and I also thought like we were right. You know, I didn't have a very 
good scope of where we stood in the world and our actions and everything. I just didn't have a good understanding of things. And the indoctrination was very, very good. Um, so like, yeah, I thought we were on the right side of things. And as I got to, into the officer training and learning more and seeing more, I realized we were very much not. And I did not want to be a part of that. And I knew that I could actually do good. I could do more good outside of a uniform. And that's when I finally decided it was time to part ways before I got any deeper in it and they could call me back at any point in my life. I wasn't having that. <laughs> Where would you go to high school? Uh, North Central. Sure. Lied about our address uh, for the first few years so I could go there. And then I had senior rights in the last year, so we didn't, they didn't care anymore. And we could also not afford the tuition if we didn't live in the district. So <laughs> well, That's a form of reparations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. right. <laughs> and so when you said you went to Tuskegee, did you did you go to Tuskegee University or mm -hmm. and then yep, I'm there, um, I had a scholarship, I had a four-year scholarship through the army uh to go there and it was wild too like I said I grew up in Brightwood, but like this was a HBCU. It was different. <laughs> uh, I had never seen unapologetic blackness to that scale in my entire life. And I honestly didn't know what to do with it at first. <laughs> um and Tuskegee is what it is. Uh, it's a great institution, but it's also one that is very much caught up in its name and its history. And sometimes that would fail us um, as students. So it's one of those things I love my time there, but I can also, you know, be critical of it and, you know, see it for what it was and also hope it, you know, and continue to hope or hope it continues to do better um, and write about the students there and stuff. So, yeah, it was a great experience. Tell me what hurricanes were. Was not ready for that. <laughs> My freshman year was Hurricane Katrina and like the seven that came before it. So uh, it was a peculiar time to go down there. <laughs> uh, I, I had a question. Um, one of them asked me, like, how do you how do you maintain? Because uh, you're you're what I would call a, a polymath, right? Like you're able to you're able to cook and be creative in in in, in a number of areas and kind of maintain them with a, with a certain level of uh, what they call black genius. So how 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 do you maintain that? What daily practices do you do to not go too far left on this or too far right on that? Um. So as soon as I wake up, like my gears just start turning and my body and my mind just want to start just going so i become more intentional about it. i start my day off like i come outside i chill like i just relax at the beginning of the day and then i give myself a couple hours like then i kind of plan things out and then i just kind of go from there and i give myself like a nice shut off time too um i've been more intentional recently about making sure when if i'm not on the clock i'm an hourly employee if i'm not on the clock homie you ain't getting no work out of me I don't need to check the messages and respond to things. If I do, I'm about to start tapping up these hours and minutes I'm spending because they add up. <laughs> you don't have to run me that check. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so knowing like just how to compartmentalize um, everything. Um, and at times if they do overlap, let them because then I can just get, I got two birds with one stone. Um, but it's still also not struggle with too, just especially like making sure I find time away from the work and the art to feed the person behind it. So that's just something I struggle with balancing and yeah, just figuring out as I go. And it's a spectrum of it too. It changes every day It's a sliding scale. Some things are gonna require more of me one day uh, than they do the next day. But thankfully my belief system now is just balance. So it's gonna ebb, it's gonna flow. I just try to roll with it as best I can. It sounds like a very, <laughs> like if you approach you, but yeah, that's, <laughs> that's how I would survive it all. <laughs> What would you say your biggest challenge right now is as an entrepreneur? Um, right now, I'm not I'm not a numbers person. I'm really not. I love science. I realize I'm good at that, but numbers just become daunting 
tedious and I just hate doing it. And <laughs> right now with the uh, like the soda side of things, like we're looking, right, we're getting our funding to really get up and going, up our scale and everything. So having to like sit down and, you know, learn how to navigate Excel, learn about taxes and all this, these things that I have just dodged my entire life because I'm a creative and I don't like concrete things. So I don't like numbers. Yeah, that was all a lie. And it doesn't work out that way. Um, so yeah, I would say that my financial literacy um, is the biggest challenge on one end. And then on the artist side of it, I would say the biggest challenge is balancing out being an organizer and creating space for others, but also remembering to practice my own art as well. So I need to book myself for shows. I don't need to just set up shows so other people can get out here and hit the stage. Like I remember, I have to remember, you know, feed myself as well with it. Have you had a lot of success or like difficulty in? So, you know, like one of the the main pieces of today's conversation was, you know, artistry in partnership. So have you had any particular successes or challenges or even like lessons learned in trying to like break through with your art into some of these institutional spaces, you know, maybe getting support from grants and stuff like that? Um, yeah, this last year has been a really cool exploration um, into that. Um Thankfully, Maurice allowed me to be in um, some rooms like the Simon Foundation talking about grants going to artists. Um, and God, you know, I want to answer your question completely. Can you, can you ask me? Because I started it down and realized I might spiral. No, it's, it's, <laughs> honestly, I say just spiral. But, um, you know, I, what have been your experiences in trying to break through with your art into mm -hmm. some of these institutional spaces? you know, trying to find partnership and people who can support you, um, you know, financially or, you know, with other forms of capital uh, as you, you know, are working through it. Oh, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so being in rooms like that and first having to get over the hump of imposter syndrome and question myself, like, do I deserve to be in a room? Like, CICF is here, NEI Humanities, gang gangs here. Like, do I actually have to see the table? I'm like, yeah, I got to see the table. Um, so, like, taking ownership of accomplishment, I think was a good first step in doing that. Um, and then from there, it's just trying. Um, I got a motto, I push it around. I think I say it every time I'm at the bar, if I'm teaching somebody, you just gotta fuck around and find out. That's the only way to do it. It's Schrodinger's cat for the hood. That's all it is. We don't know if we're gonna be good at something, something's gonna work unless you just try it. So just try, what are you gonna do? You might fail, all right, cool. You're gonna fail if you don't do it anyway. So just being more open to that risk and just jumping in or leaning into it. So like, um, I've also done photography in the past and CICF uh, in 2020 as the first grant I ever received was for photography and ain't even my main medium <laughs> at all. But like, I just tried, like, you know, I want to really want to do this project. Um, you can find it on my Instagram. Maurice was in there. He had a nice recreation of, <laughs> of a Rihanna album. <laughs> Schroeder's, um, Schroeder's cat for the hood. Yeah, Schrodinger's cat for the hood, you know, Schrodinger's cat, you got a cat in a box, a cat alive or dead, I don't know, the only way to find out is open it up, <laughs> F-A-F-O. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's an A-B-V form of it. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so I think... Um, like that definitely jumped things off. And then some like the exercises that we have with Cafe Creative, a lot of us learned how to write grants or at least got a better grasp of them by collectively applying for a creative renewal. Um, and then we also did one for the Poetry Foundation as well. So kind of like, like honing those skills. So something, when something's like very foreign to you, you don't have the confidence. So you're going to assume like, I'm not going to be that good at it. Oh, you really just needed a base understanding of it and, you know, believe in yourself a little bit and go from there. And that belief in self, you know, is something that we get when we have that community. They're able to prop us up instead of letting us stay at that gloomy place. Like maybe was talking about, like, having that community around definitely keeps us trudging through it, keeps us walking out the other side of it. So, like, yeah, we can see something that's, well, you know, two years ago, I would never imagine going for a, a large grant at all. Now, I'm like, no, nah, that should be the baseline. That's where we're starting at now. We go from there. 
Can you talk more about that piece with imposter syndrome? Because I know a lot of young people in my spaces, especially on the creative end, are struggling with that very exact same thing, you know, feeling like they're not good enough or, you know, they're not, like you said, worthy of that seat at the table. Can you talk about how, you know, you kind of overcame that mindset? Mm-hmm. Um, it, like I didn't realize until this year and like talking about imposter syndrome and cafe creator that it could be a very imposter syndrome can be a very loaded term. It can mean a lot of different things for a lot of people. Uh, the way that I've internalized it is that if I don't feel like, if I don't question myself when I'm doing something, I'm not doing enough. Um, I think that imposter syndrome or the feeling of that comes from just, you know, going through uncharted territory for yourself. And, you know, we, we know we have good ideas. We think we have great ideas, but will it carry over to everybody else? And once you hit that question mark, that uncertainty can, it can kind of just gloom, like loom over you um, and far too long. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I've taken a more positive, I guess, uh, spin on it. So if I don't feel that when I'm doing something that I'm not, you know, real vetted and super confident in, then I'll probably need to dig a little deeper and be a little bit more creative with it and draw out more of myself, um, when I'm trying it. So yes, yeah, so I've kind of turned it into a little bit of a motivational, uh, piece for myself. Because people don't do shit like, no, they don't worry that they're not good at like, you know, if you're just doing baseline stuff, you're doing everyday things like you don't worry if you're good at it or not, you're just doing it. But if you want to be good at something, yeah, you probably should question yourself at some point. And that's fine. I fully believe in questioning everything. I can be real annoying with that stuff. Um, but also in self, just so you can, you know, just have those answers. And if you can answer that for yourself, then you can definitely move past all of it. Definitely appreciate that. Anybody for, else have a question for you? Go. Yeah, I was just gonna ask like how you define success in your like art and your entrepreneurship or just in general. Um, I define success as progress. Um, so it's not really by anybody else's scale. Am I doing something better than I was before? Am I doing it in a way that I think is a lot cooler and more innovative than before? Then I think it's successful. I think as long as there's progress in what I'm doing, then it's a success. Right on. It's a sliding scale too. So <laughs> some success are going to be bigger than others, uh, but even a little progress, you know, you got to just give yourself something sometimes. <laughs> it doesn't have to be you know, going to the moon every time you shoot the shot on it, but yeah, having some grace for yourself in that, in that area is real nice. Uh, where and how can people access the soda? Uh, so hopefully they'll be dropping out very soon. Um, once these house renovations are done, it won't be an issue of having space to keep them and everything. Um, so I'm hoping by first quarter, everything, our labeling will be done. The product's already finished, pretty much just figuring out all the other stuff around it. And we'll have it out. Um, but yeah, Flourish Bevs is what we're operating under. So if you check that stuff out once... Uh, once everything gets rolling quicker, then we'll have more info out uh, as we go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you ever you get some cafe creative real much sooner. <laughs> yeah, you beat me to the point. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's all, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> can you talk about yeah, last week was a really good week. Oh. So. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jacqueline. Can you talk about the evolution of vocab since you've been past the torch? Um. Yeah. So vocab. Um. It was really, it was a, it was a wild ride uh, from when we had to shut down in March of 2020. We had just had our 15th year anniversary, and I think we were, we were averaging around like 60 people on a low end show, and that show was like over 100 people out on a Wednesday night just for some poetry. Um, I just about it. like it was really cool what we were doing, but um, we were also starting to lean into our political sides and our activism become more activated at the same time. Um, 
which was leaps and bounds from where it started. Like vocab was just an open mic in the basement at the very beginning. But as Tatiana especially like leaned into herself and how she identified, it grew to be much more than that. Um, it meant a lot of things. It means a lot of things to a lot of people, um, especially like people that are just kind of left out. Um, even in the black community, you know, anybody that isn't cis and straight, there's still that barrier to access a larger community or right? you just keep people out. We keep gatekeeping ourselves. Um, and vocab's always been the one to go against the grain with that. Even today in the city, there are black open mics and white open mics. And we always refuse to just be one of the extremes. Like, no, nah, we say we want to serve everybody. So we are going to serve everybody with it. It's not just going to be some sticker on a window somewhere. We're actually going to live this stuff out. Um, so once I came over uh, vocab and everything as curator, one of the first things I wanted to do was make sure that it wasn't just a straight dude making all the decisions for everything with vocab because that's just not what it is um so the co-host our co-host uh, january york and dj cleopatra um i immediately wanted to make sure they had an equal seat at the table when it came to vocab um trying to maintain and be intentional about displaying our allyship and enforcing it and making sure we, like if we see something we say something um and not being afraid, like, oh, what if these people think they're like, nah, nah, if there's an opportunity to do the right thing and just do it, especially when it comes to like just sharing something on social media or being um, free with information about stuff like, you know, just leaning into it and making sure that that standard is upheld. Um, it's been one of the main goals for it and just rebuilding the community um, that we had before. Um, it was very much a cathartic experience for the artists that would come to our stage and having that once a month to some extent was, you know, it wasn't a replacement for therapy, but it definitely supplemented uh, what was there. Um, and so losing that, you know, a lot of people, there was a, to a degree felt loss um, throughout that time. So, you know, just trying to bring it back and show people like, hey, we're still here for you. We got you back, come back to us, um, yeah. I, I just wanted to share this, um, and it might be hella random, but um, <laughs> I remember I was at a uh, poetry show, and I think it was at, uh, I always forget the name of this place. It was uh, uh, on 38th, uh, Ruckel. Ruckel. Oh, um, oh, God, it was right on um, Midtown of Little Cafe by the Dominoes. Yeah, yeah, and it's oh, gone. Oh, God, that's where we did fighting words and everything. Midtown, yeah, uh, a lot of memories in there. Actually, that's where I did one of my first uh hip hop shows. But I was at a poetry show, mm -hmm. and I remember, um, I think the uh host was Alpha, um, <laughs> and they were calling you up and they introduced you as the newest member of Fighting Words. And um, you got up there and you read some poetry, the first time I ever seen you perform. But the amount of uh, community and camaraderie and then also uh, just that space, it was a very, very special mm -hmm. moment. Um, and I don't know if I've ever shared that with you, but that was the first time I'd ever seen you um, express your art. And it was like some type of culmination of them welcoming you to a, a particular community um, that seemed to be very mm -hmm. special in times. So I just wanted to share that. Yeah, it definitely was like, when I came back from New York, I wanted to be on the poetry scene here and everything. And I busted my butt for months. I did not miss a show at Midtown. I was writing like crazy. I was like, yo, I don't care if I got a national ranking. Like, I want to be in with this crew. They doing it. Um, yeah, the leader of it was Alan Imagery. Uh, I'm sorry, so this was Fighting Words. Um, it was led by Alan Imagery. Jane Ray York was a part of it. Tony Sticks was in there. It's Cap Mike Perez, who now lives out of the state. Um, we always rocked with the band. So Sasha Murphy was the band director. Poncho played a bunch of shows with us. Mr. Kinetic, like, it was thick. We did a classic. We did... Um, we did a show at Classic one year, and it was at the same time as the White Party. 
which, you know, black people love a white party. I don't understand it, but we will show up and show out if you put white party on the flyer. And cats left the white party to come see some poetry. Like they had to stop letting people in. Like fighting words was, oh, it was great. It was quite the experience. It was so dope. I'm glad you were there in Midtown. Midtown was an awesome spot, especially for poetry. They brought in, so they were the first spot that I really went to here that brought in a lot of like touring poets to come through, like George and me, Abyss. These guys had just heard about it. And they were just sliding through just off the name of the, uh, off the name, reputation of the name and everything. Like, yeah, it was some cool nights there. God, I'm old. <laughs> 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 I say talk to the 79 year old about that one I'm sure she is <laughs> hopefully I'll still be saying it when I'm 79 too <laughs> okay anything else for Corey well, I appreciate you uh, coming on and chopping it up with us getting to learn a little bit more about your story like personally this is the first time I'm really getting to to know you on that level, you know, some of what your background is. So good to see you are bringing all that good intellectual, creative wealth back to the Indianapolis community and oh, yeah. happy to have you on. Yeah. Thanks everybody. So uh, with that being said, I think we can pass it on over to our uh, resident Afrofuturist, Maurice Broadus. So Maurice, you already heard from Jasmine, you heard from Corey. Can you give us your uh, super villain origin story and how you uh, came into the cafe creative space. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think I can do that. So uh, let's see. So I began writing at a at a young age. Um, I was like, I was born in London, England, and uh, we moved here to the states uh, when I was young. Uh, we moved from London, England, to Franklin, Indiana. Um, so that was a bit of a culture shock, even at a, at a young age. Um, and, but when I was put into the school system, they skipped me ahead uh, into the second grade. Um, and they knew they should have put me in the third, but they thought that, well, that could be socially awkward for me at such a young age and in the third grade already. So uh, my second grade teacher decided she was just gonna have me sit in the back of the class. She gave me a, a stack of paper and just said, hey, you're just gonna create stuff this year. And, uh, and and I loved it. I mean, I thought American school system was great. Uh, trust me on that. Um, and so, also my I need to. I've been reflecting on this here while, while uh, the other stories were going. But you know, my mother is Jamaican, and uh, and growing up, she would regale us with these stories and songs. You know, no matter what our wishes were in the moment, my mother would break out into song or she, you know, at, at night, she'd tell us these stories, um, these these Jamaican folklore stories, which, you know, in, in my uh, genre, we would call those horror stories, frankly. But uh, she would tell us these stories with these magical creatures and, and all these uh, 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 just different uh, bits of, uh, you know, just folkloric tales and everything. Uh, and so she would say, but she told us, you know, this was her family's entertainment. Right, so we're talking before TV, before internet. This was a way for them to pass down their stories and their cultures, and uh, and I and I think that lesson just sort of stayed with me, you know, throughout. And I was the first person in my family to go to college, uh, and at this point, my mom didn't want me to uh, pursue a degree in creative writing. She wanted me to do uh, something respectable, uh, which to her mind meant I should be a nurse because she was a nurse. That's why she was in England at the time. She was finishing up her nursing degree. And so she was just like, yeah, you should do something respectable. Um, I countered with the fact that uh, it's like, hey, I'm a professional daydreamer. Uh, so if I'm in charge of patients, you know, folks are just going to die. Uh, I don't know how to how to tell you otherwise. Um, so our compromise was uh, me pursuing a degree in uh, in biology. And, uh, and so though, even though I'd been writing basically pretty consistently, actually, since uh, since second grade, you know, I set down my pen and uh, began to pursue this uh, degree in biology. Uh, that lasted about two years. And, uh, and that was a, another major lesson for me in my life was that I realized I have to write, right? There's something in me that's just compelled to pick up a pen and, and tell these stories. I, I have to write. Um, this was that time when I just realized this is my passion. Writing is what I had to do, it, I, even as much as breathing. I have to, I have to write. 
Um, so I began slipping in the, the occasional uh, creative writing class. Uh, technically speaking, I, have, I do have an undeclared uh, major in English in addition to my uh, biology degree. Um, and I, I also I took during this time that I just focused on my craft. You know, I was trying to figure out what my creative voice was. I was uh, in high school, I started reading Edgar Allan Poe and I moved on to Stephen King and then Neil Gaiman. But now I'm trying to actively figure out what does it mean for me as a, as a black author what does that look like? So I'm now I'm starting to read Toni Morrison and, and Octavia Butler and Walter Mosley. Um, and so when by the time I ended uh, my, my journey in high school, I mean, in college, I, I did get that degree in biology. And I'd also, by this point, uh, gotten an honorable mention in the, the Asimov's uh, undergraduate writing contest. And so this was like 1993 and then 1994, that's when I began submitting uh, short stories to try and get them published as well as writing my first novel. Um, and then uh, 2002, uh, so by 2002, so at this point, you know, I'm a decade into my career as a scientist. Right? Um, I have a job as an environmental uh, toxicologist. It was great because it paid the bills, uh, but it also allowed me a lot of just mental free time that uh, gave me that space to uh, get my writing in. Um, I had a, a wife at this point. I had two young boys at this point. And, and I finished my first novel uh, and... You know, despite all my schooling, no one, no one actually taught me what comes next <laughs> once you write the thing. So, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm also a major comic book collector. Um, I'm in my office right now. I'm surrounded by over uh, twenty thousand comic books uh, in at this moment. Uh, and I, I did actually quit collecting by the time my second son was born because I had to make a choice between keep collecting comic books or feeding my children. Um, and after, after some prayer, I decided maybe I should feed the kids, but. Uh, at this point, I also, I was just like, I don't know what to do. So I end up writing, uh, my favorite comic book at the time was a comic book called Starman. And so I just wrote, uh, <laughs> wrote into the comic book, I wrote, wrote the author of, of the comic, uh, laid out my situation, don't know what to do next. And, uh, the, the writer, uh, of Starman was a guy named James Robinson. And so he printed my letter in the, what, when the subsequent issues of Starman, uh, and his response was, you know, maybe I should start a, or maybe he should start a, a writer's advice column um, for, for young aspiring writers. But that's basically all, all he did. But when he printed my letter, he also printed my address. And so a couple of weeks later, I got a letter in the mail from a, a horror writer named Wayne Allen Sally. Uh, and he wrote to let me know that the World Horror Convention was going to be in Chicago this year or that year. And uh, he said, if, if I came up, uh, you know, he would, we could, uh, he'd introduce himself to me and then just introduce me around. And, uh, and, and that began uh, my, uh, my journey as a, as a professional writer, because that's why I started learning um, a lot about the actual industry of publishing. Um, I, I, I won, uh, in fact, that year I, I won the, uh, an honorable mention in their short story contest. Uh, that was a big highlight for me because the award was handed to me by Neil Gaiman. Uh, the following year, I, I just won the short story contest outright. And so now I'm beginning to build uh, my name with uh, with editors and publishers and writers and starting to figure out who who I am. And um, also at this point, you know, my mentors are starting to come into my life, um, helping me along the way. And so, uh, you know, I'm building my social capital uh, and I'm. And as I'm building my social capital, you know, I'm actually I, I realized you know, I should probably start where I am. And so I looked around and, and you know, Gen Con is held here in Indianapolis. And so it's like, all right, let me uh, start building my capital here where I am locally. But also, you know, I started applying for grants uh, and that would end up funding me going to conventions uh, around the country. Um, so uh, let's see. So by 2007. Um, you know, like I said, in addition to being a, a scientist still, um, I'm also helping to plant a church. Um, this led to me uh, making decisions were made. I will cop to that. Uh, my brand became uh, the Sinister Minister. Decisions were made. It's like talking about your porn past, right? Uh, there are still pictures of me in my Sinister Minister getup that I, uh, there, I think I even have some stuff around here. But, you know, and I don't even really like viewing myself as a brand per se, uh, but I look at, you know, the Sinister Minister and stuff like that. You know, it's basically my elevator pitch uh, of who I am and what I do. So you get a good sense of what I'm about. Um, the fact that the pastor at the time 
uh, had, had come to me and said, hey, uh, can you come up with some out of the box ways of, of doing ministry? Because uh, you just want to come at ministry in a whole different way. And I was like, oh, I got you. I got you. Um, and so I came up with the idea of MoCon. Um, and MoCon was basically, I mean, it was me trying to, to solve a lot of problems with, with one stone, basically. So um, one is, is, is handing that, that ministry piece because uh, MoCon was basically a horror writing convention we would just hold in a church. Um, but it was also a way for me to bring in this national network that I'm building through going, being able to go to conventions and everything, bringing in that national network so they could, uh, so I, so my local network could start to build, uh, build their social capital also. So I'm, I'm bringing in these national writers with their, we're, we're, um, we're building within the local writing community. Um, and though I never looked at MoCon as a, as particularly as, as a marketing tool at all. In fact, it was just me, as far as I was concerned, it was just me being true to my passions and, and, and trying to live that out as best I can. But um, people noted it as a great marketing tool. Um, in particular, uh, the publisher of Apex Books uh, approached me because uh, he appreciated what I was doing as a writer and just the totally different way I was just coming at, at things. And so uh, it became the basis of our, our friendship. Uh, and so uh, by this point, I think I'd written a, uh, four novels, uh, uh, none of which have seen the light of day, will ever see the light of day. Um, but I, I, but publishing wise, you know, I published about, probably about maybe a dozen short stories at this point, a couple of novellas. Uh, but I, I remember in, in 2009, in April of 2009, uh, you know, thanks to a lot of the connections I made at Gen Con, I was able to uh, have uh, my, my novel, uh, Kingmaker, was accepted for publication uh, as part of a three book deal. Um, and I was able to get an agent. And then that same month, Apex Books came to me and just like, hey, can you edit this uh, anthology um, called Dark Faith? And originally it was basically the MoCon anthology, um, but we just broadened it to go, hey, uh, we're, we're gonna talk about these issues of faith and, and dark storytelling and and see where that, that takes us. And so, you know, this is a culmination of, of everything I've been working for uh, my entire career. So naturally this is when my life fell apart. Now, I had a lot of personal things going on. Um, uh, I was also diagnosed during this time as a, a bipolar and hypomanic. Um, and then I just had the sheer stress of uh, meeting all these new deadlines. I had to add 30,000 words to my first book, um, which was the only book at the time. And, uh, and that was due in like that August. And then I had to completely write a second book by that December um, wholesale. Um, and I had to have all of Dark Faith, uh, uh, all those stories. We had like over 600 submissions. And out of that, I had to, you know, winnow that down into uh, the final manuscript by that December. So from June to December, I don't even remember the last half of 2009. Um, it was nothing but a blur of words. But I did hit all my deadlines. Um, unfortunately, my job was like, you have not been here, <laughs> essentially, for like the last few months. And so... Uh, uh, I lost my job. Uh, at the same time, I parted ways with, with the church I'd been, uh, and I helped establish. And end of 2009, it's like, okay, uh, who am I and what am I going to be? And so, uh, you know, I, I decided basically to kind of look at this as an opportunity, you know, when all of a sudden I think I just, uh, beginning of 2010, I'm just turned 40. Uh, and I'm like, you know what, I, have, I actually have the opportunity to rebuild my life around around my the a new set of priorities, basically. I, I don't, I, you know, if I'm out of the rat race, you know what? Why jump back into the rat race? I have this opportunity to to part ways with that and just kind of figure out who I want to be and how I want to live my life, uh, and and build a life, frankly, that centered uh, me as a writer. Um, I just had no idea of what that was going to look like. Um, and so uh, I, I look at this as a series of, of attempts. So my first attempt, um, I tried making my life as a, as a freelance writer. Um, I took on ghostwriting projects. I wrote ad copy. I was doing social media content for uh, content mills. And I absolutely hated it. This was, this was awful. This was a, 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 an awful way for to live as far as I was concerned, especially as a, as a writer. Um, but I mean, at the time though, I mean, I treated it seriously. You know, I'd get up in the morning, I'd change into my my, my work clothes for the day, and I'd go to the coffee shop and, and I'd do my writing. But none of it was the writing that that brought me joy. None of it was the writing that I wanted to do. You know, this was this this, this was work. <laughs> you know, and I, I didn't want 
what I love doing to be reduced to just a job. Um, <laughs> and I was motivated because my wife threatened to leave me because money wasn't coming in the way she liked. So <laughs> uh, and that's just a real pressure. That's just a real world pressure. I'm, I'm, uh, that you know, part. I'm, Right, right. I've been, uh, we just hit our, our 10 year anniversary. I have uh, two boys, they are eight and nine at this point. And, uh, you know, this and this first way of me trying to figure out my life that just was not working. All right, so we'll try experiment number two. Uh, well, actually, there was another thing that I, I learned at this point too. Uh, a new term in publishing I hadn't learned before is called a death spiral. Um, and what a death spiral is, is a uh, uh, so book one of my trilogy, Kingmaker, it did really well. However, books two and three entered this death spiral, which means uh, each book sold, we'll just say significantly less. Uh, uh, to the, you know, I think there might've been six people that may have bought that third book, maybe. Um, so significantly less, that was a death spiral. Um, but I still wanted to, to build my, my life, you know, in, in a way that centered my writing. And so uh, some, some things that happened and an opportunity presented itself where I was able to, to, to start a, a homeless and, and re-entry men's ministry. And so, uh, and, and we set up the ministry in a way so that uh, I still had my time to write. So I would write in the mornings and then I would run the organization starting in the late morning through, through the afternoon. Um, oh, let's see, it was called City of Refuge, that's right, uh, Cities of Refuge. And, uh, and, 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 and the ministry, so we basically did this uh, communal living situation um, we taught principles of live, what it meant to live in community, build relationships. We did skills training. Uh, we uh, formed the men into a, a work crew. And we uh, and as we would acquire new properties, um, we would have the men as their own work crew rehab the homes. Um, and they would become uh, new homes where we could expand uh, the ministry and, and bring in more men and just keep the process going. Um, and I think we were up to uh, four homes that we had done when we just flat out ran out of money and uh, had to shut the whole thing down. Um, and so, you know, I, while I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm like, right, so, that, 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 you know, we tried it. Let me, let me try and start figuring out my new move uh, to, to keep this going forward. But my wife was just like, look, you know, if, uh, you know, I've been riding as long as I can, but can you get a normal job? And, and by normal, what she meant is like something with regular pay that had regular hours with like regular benefits. Um, Cause this, this journey of, of me, you know, figuring out how I'm gonna live as a, as a full-time artist, I mean, it was stressful to her. And, uh, and I never wanted to be to the point where I was being selfish about what I pursued and who I wanted. And even though it was something that I pursued, you know, me, what I was meant to do, I don't wanna be selfish about it and do it at the expense of her or my family because in the end, if I, if I have this new set of priorities, which I'm living by, well, frankly, one of those new set of priorities is, is family first. Uh, so they are, they are my bedrock. And so it's like, all right, uh, let, let, let's, uh, let's get a, 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 a normal job. Um, and so I end up becoming a, a telemarketer uh, for, for a while. Um, I don't know if you've seen the movie, Sorry to Bother You. Uh, but like that, that first half of the movie is basically a documentary of, of my life at, at the time. Um, you know, especially the sales voice I was able to put on was like, how are you doing? And let me hear your story. And I know that what we can do can help further you and your journey. Yeah, I had to, I had the whole voice and, and pattern down. Um, but, um, but, but this was a, an important step in my, my artistic journey also. I just didn't realize it at the time. Uh, Cause you know, now I'm back in the corporate setting. Uh, and this wasn't like when I was a, at a, a scientist, because when I was a scientist, I could still set my own schedule. No, I'm at a regimented nine to five. Um, and so I have to figure out, but I, you know, like I said, my priority is I'm still a writer first. So I need to figure out how am I gonna make my artwork in this corporate environment? Um, and so one of the things I uh, learned at this point is I, I realized I couldn't just wait, uh, wait on time to write. I had to make time to write. Um, and so what that looked like in this context, you know, I had uh, two 15 minute breaks uh, and an hour lunch as part of the job. Um, and I knew, okay, those are gonna be my, my windows to get my writing done. Um, but I approached my manager and said, hey, instead of two 15 minute breaks, can I get two half hour breaks plus the hour lunch so I can get my writing done? And uh, my manager said, um, no, which <laughs> completely valid. Um, so I said, I, I, you know, I get that, I absolutely get that. Um, 
uh, how's this as a counter proposal though? I'm going to take up smoking and I'm going to take the six breaks that I see my colleagues taking every day. And then my manager like, you know what, go ahead and take your two half hour breaks. And I'm like, okay, good. And so, uh, so that's how I, I uh, end up uh, uh, doing my writing. I, I, and so it was a whole different way. I had to be very disciplined about how I was doing my writing at this point, uh, which, which served me and actually still serves me well to this day. So there's no waiting on my muse. There's no waiting for a moment. It's just like, hey, there's my time. I got to get it in. And so, uh, and, and part, of, part of that is because the only thing I could control as as a writer, as an artist, as a creative, the only thing I could control, I can't control my sales as the death spiral proved. Um, I can't con control any awards consideration. I can't control marketing for uh, for the most part. Um, I, I, there's some some things I can do, but for the most part, I mean, this is the whims of, of life, the universe, uh, the industry. There's a whole lot I can't control. But what I can control is me putting pen to paper and just getting my writing done. Um, so one of the things I learned during this time, I, I learned how to write fast. Um, a part of me writing fast is I learned uh, uh, to abandon perfectionism because perfectionism was just going to get in the way of me putting words to paper. So it's like, hey, I can't, I can't afford that. God created second drafts, so let me just get the, the stuff out of me uh, first, and I, let me just get just keep getting the writing done. Um, and also, during, so as I'm uh, trying to pursue my writing during this time, and I'm still at the corporate gig, well, during this time, I end up becoming a consultant on a video game called Watch Dogs 2. Um, and so I, I pursue that project. Um, I end up selling my uh, novella, Buffalo Soldier, to a major publisher. And uh, I end up selling my, uh, short, my first short story collection of Voices of Martyrs. I end up selling that. And so I'm feeling this momentum of my career just sort of shift. And then, uh, I, you know, I, and I'm like, I think I can really make a go of things as a full-time writer at this point. I, I with this momentum, and this is a springboard to allow me some uh, some grace. And so, um, uh, with the permission of my wife, because uh, we'd also made an agreement that I couldn't do anything to purposely get myself fired from a, this regular job. Uh, so, with her permission, I, I engineered my own firing. And uh, and the reason I, I say engineered my own firing is because I needed to get on unemployment, so I needed them to fire me. And so, uh, and and the plan was. Uh, for me to be on unemployment for, for two years, so the first year and a half, I would just stockpile writing. It's like, I'm just going to go full board, get my writing in for a year and a half. I'm going to get some write short stories, get some novels written, you know, I'm gonna create this sort of writing stockpile. Um, and then in the last six months, I'm going to find a job. Um, and that, that, so that was my, uh, my, my great plan. Yeah, my plan lasted about six months. Uh, during this time, I was wrestling with the idea of like, well, you know, again, considering the new uh, priorities I want to live my life by, but I kept coming back to the fact of, you know, I, I want to make the world a better place. I want to have impact uh, in my community, in my neighborhood. I want to be an agent of change, but I'm, I'm just a writer. Um, so I don't know how I could do any of that. And so uh, the idea of being a, just a writer and, and what its impact would look like uh, in the community, that became the main, uh, main idea I was exploring when I was writing my novel, Pimp My Airship. Uh, which is about an open mic poet, because uh, apparently poets have played an instrumental role in my my life and creative journey. So it was following the the path of this uh, the journey of this poet um, as this poet discovers discovers his voice and what his voice looks like in terms of impacting the community, speaking truth to power, organizing other creatives, um, and and creating shifts, uh, real world shifts. Um, and then also I. I uh, this is actually when I kind of uh, discovered my first kind of discovering of, of Kepra because Kepra was doing a, a gentrification panel. And uh, I remember there were several folks on, on the gentrification panel, which I was curious to see, uh, you know, what their opinions were on this topic. I, I go there. Um, there's this dude named Wildstyle on the panel, and he talks about this uh, Black arts creative uh, uh, collective that, he, that he's a, a part of uh, called The Learning Tree. And I'm just like, ooh, wait, Black's art, a Black arts collective. Uh, let, let me find out more about that. Um, and so I end up uh, hanging out with the learning tree uh, for for a bit, um, and 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 my writing sort of takes a, a, a bit of a pivot. You know, I, I begin writing about about community. You know, I'm reimagining. Uh, you know, the, the I'm highlighting stories of my neighbors and and the work being done in the community, and, and just sort of reimagining it through like this uh, um, through through my lens of, of speculative fiction. You know, what, what that looks like. Um, also, this time uh, I was. Um, end up uh, being a substitute teacher over at a, 
well, I'd always been a substitute teacher at whatever school my, my boys were attending. And, and this at this point, I'm at the middle school. And so between these two things, I, you know, I'm starting to, you know, I'm starting to find the full time uh, employment that allowed me the room uh, to have that sort of consistent income while I still pursued my art. Um, and then uh, lured by uh, free meals and being tricked into a, a series of meetings, I find myself at the Kepper Institute. Uh, and so uh, uh, my career sort of explodes at this point, honestly. Uh, you know, I end up writing, I think during this time, I end up writing like about a dozen short stories, uh, a novelette. In fact, the novelette was distinctly, I, I do remember that moment of that, that novelette, the inspiration moment of that novelette was an argument me and M were having, not really an argument, a discussion about the uh, importance of jazz music and uh, improvisation as a leadership skill. Uh, and I've sort of like, uh, you know, that just lodged my brain and all of a sudden I'm imagining um, starships powered by jazz music and uh, uh, captains, uh, starship captains trained in improvisation and, and, uh, and the importance of that as, as a leadership tool in, uh, in their adventures. Um, I get my second agent during this time and, and uh, I end up getting a, a, a two book deal, um, a two book deal with uh, HarperCollins for a series of middle grade, grade books and a three book deal uh, with uh, tour books uh, for a space opera series, uh, again, just inspired by my work uh, uh, and the work being done by Kepra. Um, so while bopping around in, in the Kepra space, um, I end up uh, in uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the initial um, conversations about uh, Cafe Creative, and uh, uh, which was their initiative in, into the art space. Um, uh, I remember yeah, me and uh, Diop and uh, Damon and, and Tatiana on these meetings. Oh, Mariah was in, in these meetings. And uh, and we were talking about, you know, the different philosophy of, of how a cafe creative could operate by, what it would look like to have an artist controlled uh, venue space, what that could look like. Um, and, and then the pandemic hit. And, uh, uh, we, we, you know, lockdown happens, you know, and I'm, uh, you know, and, and, and to my mind, okay, well, you know, if, uh, yeah, everybody on the, on the team has to go to different things as alchemy starting to uh to uh bubble up and it's becoming an all hands on deck thing and so i'm i'm in uh so i'm kind of like oh well i i just uh you know kind of chill out on my porch i declared my porch my uh new coffee shop um that i, I would do my writing from and uh, i even i'm even tweeted uh tweeted about it being my new coffee shop and my neighbors being my regulars um and then uh after that soon after that actually uh some of the artists in the community uh want to know if the the coffee shop was open for visitors and i'm like oh yeah sure and so uh, folks started dropping by uh you know and, uh, uh they, they dropped by you know we'd hang out chop it up uh my mom who who lives with us uh she would come out and serve everybody tea um and we just become this uh ritual and then realize after a while that uh you know there are like a dozen or so folks come to the porch every week uh, and then I was reminded that uh, as Cafe Creative, we, I mean, though we talked about a venue, we weren't about a venue. Uh, we were about relationships. At our core, we were about relationships. And what does uh, the power of relationships look like? And so uh, once Alchemy did get started up, it was suggested that uh, all the artists who were coming to the porch, uh, they they should enroll in it. And then uh, and then we would create a cohort uh, out of the artists with with me as a mentor. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so we did that, uh, meeting, uh, on the, on the porch over, uh, meals and, uh, uh, libations and, uh, and, and with our focus mostly being about building relationships. Um, and so, yeah, when Al Alchemy ended, which, uh, it had ended and it took me two weeks to notice because, <laughs> you know, I wasn't really, you know, married to the calendar by any stretch. Um, but I was just like, Hey, uh, Alchemy's actually over. Um, uh, why don't we just have a little goodbye, uh. Uh, a, a goodbye time and then we'll just part ways and everything and uh, uh the pushback came is like or or we could just keep doing this and so uh so the, the folks on the porch they, they self-organized into cafe creative which was again nothing we could have planned on but it was organic and it sprang up from the relationships that were being built in that space um so uh these days um I mean, we we still uh, we sort of split our time these days. Um, uh, we we all meet down at a uh, uh, Octavius Vision, a uh, visionary campus. We we meet there, and we still meet on, on my porch. 
Um, but our time, I mean, nothing has really changed because at the core, our time is still being focused around building relationships, developing social capital, um, mentoring each other across our various uh, art disciplines. And, uh, and yeah, creating that space of, of healing and encouragement for each of us as, as we pursue our, our artistic journeys. You know, we, we plan projects to, uh, that we can do collaborative, collaboratively, um, things that, uh, that we can use to build community wealth. Uh, because we recognize that you know we're all on this journey that we could do alone, uh, but we go farther if we can do if we do it together. And so, one thing I just love to say about Cafe Creative is, you know, we, uh, how we grow is we grow with the speed of relationships. I wouldn't have it any other way. How can uh, folks get access to a Cafe Creative? You know, when does it happen? Where does it happen? Yeah. So uh, it meets uh, Mondays at uh, from uh, six to eight uh, at the Octavius Visionary Campus, um, and then uh, there's a, a not a side group, but uh, something that's, that's bubbled up uh, out of Cafe Creative has been uh, this. Uh, we have no name. We probably ought to come up with a name, but it's basically our our, uh, our screenwriters committee. Uh, we realize we have a lot of folks who are in that field of. Uh, writing screenplays and, and, and developing movies. And one of the conversations that happened in, in uh, Cafe Creative was a project that could allow us all to work collaboratively on something big it could be like a film project. Um, so no matter what your art discipline is, we could all be a part of that, uh, of a film project. So uh, we uh, originally, it was just a couple of us working on a potential uh, uh, TV pilot that uh, we would uh, figure out how to self-fund and, and, and shoot and everything. And then realized there were several folks working on their own uh, screenplays. And so it became sort of an accountability group. And that group still meets uh, off my porch. And uh, so that's on Fridays, uh, uh, one to three. <laughs> nice, thanks. Um, and we and, are. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry. And then, and, and the way uh, way people find their ways into Cafe Creative, uh, as as Jasmine said, uh, is is either through uh, invite because, like I said, we grow at the speed of relationships, or it's from folks coming in through uh, through this space, the the alchemy space. <laughs> exactly. So make sure you let folks know you found it through the alchemy workshop. That's probably good enough. Probably maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it is 1201 now. I know we close these out at noon, uh, but I still did want to give us a chance to ask Maurice some questions. If that's good with you, Maurice, I didn't know what your time frame was looking like. Yep. I uh, suspected that we might run over, so I have allowed myself additional time for, for this for this session. Wonderful. Well, uh, I think we can hit Maurice with some questions if anybody's got any, and then we can close it up for today. Hey, <clears throat> Jay Rue, this is Khalil. <clears throat> Excuse me, y'all. I just want to say that, uh, first of all, every time I hear Maurice tell his story, I learn uh, uh, it's amazing, another piece uh, uh, uh something new. But I've just been listening since Jasmine, Corey, and Maurice, and just moving around through my day. And for all my NPR people, this is killing the mouth hour. <laughs> this is killing the mouth hour. These are some very compelling, uh, engaging, interesting, a uh, person who loves stories and hear people's you know journey just so impressive to hear you all's journey so thank you for sharing and helping my Saturday morning appreciate it uh, you appreciate Khalil, if you hear Khalil say that he's a hater, he's a hater you know it's impressive work <laughs> <laughs> hey Maurice could you speak a little bit about uh same question I asked uh Corey earlier the the, the challenges in the present for you navigating uh race art and entrepreneurship yeah, so the race piece uh, has been something that uh, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting to navigate because uh, like coming up as a as a horror writer originally, you know there was like a handful of us in any you know I talked about going to these different conventions where there were a handful of us at these conventions at the beginning of my career, um, and I mean literally a handful. I could to this day I can name the five of us um, in, in the space. And so, the, but the five of us became close friends during this, uh, during this time. So we've actually come up in the genre together, still supporting each other, still holding each other accountable in very real ways. And, uh, uh and just realizing, Hey, we have to move through these spaces differently. Um, because we have all these editors who are trying to get us to write to the market, for example, and, and making our voices small and, uh, and acceptable to, uh, uh their, their default spaces. Um, 
Uh, and but we were there because we had a relationship with each other. It gave us a, a space where we could just go, no, no. Uh, a, we're going to be us, and we're going to be loud, and we're going to be loudly us. Uh, our voices on our terms, and frankly, um, your default state ignores the fact that no, we're in the marketplace too. There are stories that we want to read that you aren't servicing that we can service. So um, there was uh, a lot of constant pushing back against conventional thinking, a lot of pushback, pushing back against editors, publishers, as we we're trying to, you know, carve out our space along the way. Um, uh, I, one of my examples I, I use is like uh, uh, my, my first middle grade book, uh, Usual Suspects. It's about two young Black boys who become uh, their own, they always, you know, in the school system, when something goes wrong, they blame, you know, the usual suspects, these two young Black boys. And so they become their own detectives to figure out what really happened with the latest thing they've been accused of. Um, I originally wrote that book in like 2012, and I knew that book was dead on arrival in the in the industry. But like I said, some things that happened in my personal life, um, and so I had to kind of step away from writing for uh, for a bit. And when I came back, by when I by the time I came back, some different movements had happened in the in the industry. The the We Need Diverse Books movement had happened, um, and so now my book, you know, now there's a vacuum there that my, uh, it takes me no time to sell the book. Um, when the Black Lives Matter but ha movement happens, um, and now people are very conscious of, hey, um, you know, op different opportunities have uh, have arisen because of that. And, like initially, um, the weird thing to navigate was all of a sudden, you know, people are like, hey, we just realized there are five black people here, so now suddenly the five black people in the industry get all the opportunities, and we're like, oh no, no, no. That's, uh, you know, while, while we appreciate the thought and you remembering that we've been here, you know, how do we, uh, and, and we talk and we talk. And so it became a conversation of how do we use the spot that we're in to leverage opportunities for other voices, for new voices and create opportunities for those who are coming up behind us. And so we've always been conscious of, of that as we move through different spaces. How do we, you know, we've been at the game for a bit. So how do we, you know, this door, this door of opportunity is open. How do we, you know, stick our foot in the door and allow as many folks through as possible, you know, while this opportunity, this moment is here. Uh, Cause history has, teach, uh, has taught us that, you know, these moments happen, but you know, the, these doors shut after a while you know, when the pushback happens. So while we're here, how do we create uh, different institutions that allow us to move through spaces differently to support each other? How do we create opportunities for one another? How do we leverage social capital for one another and just help all of us move through this uh, uh, together? I had like a couple of takeaways from you sharing your story. Um, one of them is like, you are like a phoenix. It seems like you have um, recreated yourself a, a few times based off of the needs of the people that you care about. So like your mother, you became a biologist and then for your wife, you had to get this money to provide for your family. And every time that those, um, those ways that you have built yourself have failed, you have been able to reemerge more as yourself. And I feel like that's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and then another thing that I wanna say too, as you spoke to the main character of Pimp My Airship, a lot of who you describe that person to be, I feel like you encompass within yourself. So your writings are also manifestations because mm -hmm. you are that leader. So that's just all I had to say. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I had a question. Um, yeah. And you have a unique perspective, right, in terms of just where you're at at this time. Um, and so what do you see coming down the road in the future, particularly uh, how it impacts community? There's just kind of like you said, awakening of a certain uh, consciousness. And so do you look at that? Where is it going? How are things converging? And how does that impact our role in it? Yeah. No, it's, uh, and this kind of goes back to M's question about the navigating the waters we find ourselves in is, yeah, th we have all these opportunities that are presenting themselves. And, and you know, you have these you know, it ripples from publishing to Hollywood. Uh, you know, these are unique times, unique opportunities that are popping up. 
And so there are a lot of folks being offered, you know, the, you know, opportunities that we wouldn't have been offered, you know, a decade or so ago. Um, but I think there's an inherent trap in it also, um, especially if we're out there on our own. Um, because, you know, it's easy for, for, uh, you know, a young artist to like, Ooh, Hollywood's taking interest in me. Um, and, and they get sucked into the Hollywood machinery, um, or the publishing machinery on their own. And if they're on their own, they get chewed up by the Hollywood machinery and the publishing machinery, because that's the nature of the beast. Um, it's about the commodity and you cease to exist as a person as a creative, you are a commodity and, it, and you were only useful to them as a commodity. Um, and, and so, like I said, there's that potential trap. And so where our role in it is sort of reminding creatives of their personhood. So one, they are more than just a commodity. And so it's like, how, how do we uh, navigate the, you know, the need to eat versus the need to pursue our art? What does what that navigation look like? What does that not, what does it look like to go, hey, wait a second, uh, maybe I shouldn't be doing this alone. Maybe I should be entering into these spaces as as part of networks of relationships so that hey, uh, the machine can try to chew us up, but hey, if there's enough of us, hey, we'll, maybe we'll choke it, you know, uh, or you know, at least make a difference so that we just are coming in as a, a not as individuals, but as a, uh, as a, as a collector. And then frankly, the third is also how do we create our own institution? So we're actually not dependent on the beast, right? So that we're, uh, how do we create systems so that we're able to move through our own agency, our own agency, our own uh, liberation to, to move uh, as, as a group, as a people. So how do we, how do we speak to that as, as a collective of artists? So I think that that could be uh, where our role could lie. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. All right, how are we feeling, beautiful people? <laughs> feeling good? All right, well, I think we can close it out for today. Once again, Jasmine, Corey, Maurice, thank you all so much for joining us. My dog is giving me some praises as well. She's barking loud. Um, but yeah, I just want to appreciate you all for coming on, being so candid, so vulnerable, so real in this space. We need that so, so much uh, in this current climate. So really appreciate you all for coming on and doing this workshop for us. And that's all I got for you guys today. So I think we can close it out there if all is well and good with everybody else. Thanks for having us. Uh, peace. Thanks, God. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Bye, mystery. Bye. Bye, mystery. Oh, mystery. Hey, looks good. Ah, thanks. Y'all, you looking cute. <laughs>